But how was your cycle ride? The cycle ride, ride was lovely. I think there's a certain... Uh, I very enjoy the uh, transitory atmosphere of the landscape every day. Uh, uh, and it might be a cityscape or a, a country landscape or a seascape, but um, it's different every day. I like landscape painting. And I think what I learned from the the old masters that, that, that all the, the atmosphere is dictated by the sky. Okay. Now you're, the sun's so you're not just talking Turner, right? You're talking loads of people. Oh, Turner's too modern for me. Um, he, I like the old ones. So I like the sort of the, uh, the Albert Kipes and the, um, and the, the, the sort of 17th century and the, the 16th century Dutch and Flemish ones. They're the ones that really get me going. So the, uh, so yes. And, and you, you go, and of course now it's not quite, but another month and things will start coming out again, the plants and the, the trees and the things another month. So it's, you feel as everything's just being got ready to get out. And if you were in London or in a city somewhere, the same sort of, you know, you can still see this, you know, the, the tree here. If you walk through the parks, people's gardens, you can see people just slightly not wearing such big coats anymore. You can feel things just coming and so the spring's coming. So I like that that feeling that the, that the spring's coming. And I think I'm probably more aware of it uh, and more uh, um, uh, sensitive to atmosphere of, 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 uh, of changing atmosphere than I probably was um, when I was a, a youth. Okay, but does that mean that you would say right now, I really totally have a favourite time of year and that actually this time that we've just been through is just waiting for something more glorious to happen? Is that what you're really saying? Oh, I think that's definitely the case. I think something, I do think that the, the spring, when it comes, I think will be for lots of people uh, great. I think there are still awful things happening in the world, but one of the you know literally there's plagues and wars and things but i feel as though we are maybe just getting past the plague but i do think it's you've still got to be careful by the way because people like still keep getting it all the time um you know that we're recording this on what is it the 9th of march or whatever it is today but it's like uh 11 what is it i can't even think the 11th, 11th of march now, yeah yeah and 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 even as we speak somebody was going to come around later today but they're not now because they've had covid and although so I think it's all around, but I think it is going past. And I think when the spring comes, people do feel it's, I think it's an ancient thing, a feeling in people. I don't have a particular favourite time of year. My favourite time of year is the moment I'm in. So talking to you now, I'm, that's my favourite moment of the year because I'm in it right now. And mostly it's, it's, I think, you know, some a guru once said to me, you know, some people think tomorrow if this happens and this happens, everything will be wonderful. And other people say, oh, there was a great golden age we lived in and it was like that again. But in fact, true gurus say, well, the paradise is the moment you're in. I think that's the great thing. So talking to you now at this moment, now we've managed to communicate. That's I couldn't want for anything more. That's it. I'm very happy. No, I feel very content as well. Um, and But it's really interesting that you are talking about the kind of seasonal thing and never mind what's oh, everything that's happening in the world right now. And, and maybe at this on this part of the world, in this part of the world, we are going to be enjoying longer days. And of course, on the other side of the world, they're going to be getting shorter days. But when we had our last conversation, um, you were just getting over the big power cut of the, the windy storms. Um, and I said to you, you know, does it feel kind of romantic to have um, <laughs> this amazingness of uh, no power and it's just candles and it's going back to the kind of centuries of your, um, the beautiful art gurus that you love so dearly, you know, was that lovely? And you said, well, yes, maybe it was all right for a little bit. And I said, well, what about the piano? And you said it was just too cold to play the piano. So does that mean, are you one of those people who can sit down at any time of day unless it's really really freezing because you've had no power for three days are you able to just sit down at the piano at any time and the fingers can feel fine and you can just kind of get going and it feels wonderful or do you have to kind of feel like your fingers are warm or that um you're in the mood well i certainly don't think i'm i suppose i'm always in the mood i'm always ready and very keen to make friends with whatever piano it is or 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 continue my friendship with the ones I've got because they're all different. No, no two pianos are the same. I can see you've got one behind you there, and I can, I can sort of, I guess what that, I'm sort of guessing what that one feels like. But you, I need to spend ten minutes with it to make friends with it. But even the very what people would deem as the most sort of tatty old rubbish pianos, I can, I can make friends with. So I'm not a fuss pot in that way. Uh, if it's really, if my fingers are cold, I think 
as you know yourself, uh, that is spray, it, that gets a bit tricky. If your fingers are really cold, you can't sort of move them. If it's in a cold room, that doesn't bother me. When I was, um, we, I, I didn't have a piano when I was small, and I really wanted one because I was obsessed with playing it. My grandmother had one in our front room, but also there was a, a church hall that had one in it, and I was I could go in there and play it, and that was right. But that was freezing cold, and it was. It's a bit hard, I think, being freezing cold. You can't, it's really difficult to play just because you can't, as you know yourself, you can't get your fingers to work. But I find that uh, wouldn't, whatever the mood you're in, I mean, that's why music is so fantastic for, uh, for me personally. Whatever mood I'm in, whether I was in a sort of a, a, an elated mood because it was a fantastic spring day and my horse had just won a race or something, or whether it was the sort of um, a really, there was a power cut uh, and it was all looking pretty miserable. And, the, and there was a power cut because it had been cut off because I didn't have enough money to the bill. Whatever it was, if you sit at the piano, it makes it better. So I think that's the thing for me that I would say about the music um, generally and generally about the, the piano as well. But I do think you do really need to have circumstances where, um, you know, and you're also the piano has to, you have to sort of read the room. If you're out of, it, it's very good and quite hard. You realise, but I, when I first started, realize that you want to sometimes just develop and play ideas and play and play and play but you don't want to drive people mad with it i mean some people are unaware of that and couldn't care less but i realized that you know that by going over the same thing again and again which you sort of have to do when you're learning it because you over the piece you love or what and you're trying to figure it out that actually it might be a bit annoying for the neighbors and things like that um so having a space where you can play where you you're not going to bother people is really good and if you are in a place where there are lots of people, then you've got to sort of read the room and think what would maybe I'll just play something that would suit the atmosphere of the room. Sometimes you just have to play for the room or the atmosphere, I think, you know, that's all right. But you see, that's, that's really, I think that's really true. And of course, you know, if you're a violinist, then I can put on four clothes pegs attached to the, the bridge because I've forgotten my practice mute and I'm going to be able to be really soft and no one's going to hear what's actually happening and it can be just really personal to me. But you're right, everybody can hear what's happening. And of course, these days we could say, well, Jules, you know, you can have a piano that's got a, a headphone socket in there and then you can just uh, be absolutely private in there. But with most Joannas around the world, they are just as they are. And so that yeah, means all, you are sharing. Also, the other thing about the piano, and it's very important that I think people often forget, which is why electronic pianos, you know, they've got better and better over the years. They don't really, and things where you plug a headphone in, the piano isn't just a, um, a, a harmonic instrument, it's a percussive instrument, it's a drum kit. You know, you've got to be able to play the drums. It's like uh, a lot of my favourite pianists. I mean, I've got a poster for Fats Waller when he was playing at the Finsbury Park Empire in 1936 or 37, something like that. Uh, actually, it's a good story. I'll tell you about how I got it in a moment. But but on it, he's billed as, and there are, he is billed as America's top rhythm pianist. Rhythm which pianist. Which is kind of, mm -hmm. he's a rhythm pianist. And you realise that's what, that's why he's exciting. You know, for instance, I remember when I'd hear Scott Joplin, it didn't excite me at all. But Fats Waller, I thought this is the best thing ever because it was rhythm. So he's like playing a drum kit. So I realised when I was, and also when I looked at a lot of the great piano players I, who I liked, they were doing this with their foot. And when I heard, and John Lee Hooker does a record called Teach It. Oh, that's messed up my recording here. John Lee Hooker does a, uh, a uh, uh, thing called Teaching the Blues. And he says, and he's playing a guitar, and he says, hmm, he says, I'm just going to stay on the one here. And he's playing away. And it's really great. And he says, yeah, I don't need it. I don't need to change. I know there's no four chord, no five. I'm just staying on the one. And then maybe I'll think about changing when I feel in the mood, but I'm not in the mood now. He said, and, so, and it is, it's just, it's just, you've got to get a groove first, got to get this groove. And he said, and I don't, he said, look, you don't need no drum kit. He said, you hear that drum, you hear that beat and you can hear this sort of click, tick, 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 tick going on in the background. He said, that's my feet. My feet is the drum. I thought, oh yeah. Also because the solo artist, um, especially, uh, you know, didn't, doesn't have the money for her perhaps or the, or the, or the space for a drummer. So your foot is the drum kit. So a piano and the, and the, and I and particularly for me and I realised when I was um, starting that I had a I lived in this little flat with the with the people below that it was not just the piano that they were fight, that they were kind of hearing and the bit but the bit that they find disturbing was my foot doing that bang 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 because that to me was connected it was the same one as the piano so the idea of playing without rhythm i mean it is a different thing it's, it's romantic playing i suppose is in the classical world i think that's the word for it you know where you play something in a romantic thing without the, 
the sort of syncopation. But for me, my own particular stylings, that wasn't that. It was the syncopation. So um, I, uh, I think what I'm saying is I am a, a pretty noisy neighbour. Um, but it also means that the piano is, uh, that's the thing about it. It is, a, it is it's like rhythm, you know. It's, it's, I think people, um, people uh, sometimes forget that about it. That's, it's, that's it's one of the great things about it. It's a drum kit. Right, so basically you're saying that you um, create social groove, okay, that people can really, can, people can really, really feel that pocket because you're giving yourself the beat, but you're also giving that syncopated kind of a feel. I think, I tell you what, I think that's, I hadn't thought that until you said it, but I think certainly uh, when you're playing, uh, if you're playing, which I used to do alone in a pub or uh, if it's a solo piano thing or in a, in a, uh, and my first, actually, and I'd forgotten this until I found my mother had kept the card. My first gig, when I was about 15, I got a gig in Bieber um, department store oh, yeah. uh, playing f- f- in the restaurant. And somebody I knew worked there, and they said, oh, they want a pianist for their, for, and so I went in, and I didn't realise this, but the owners were sitting at the next table having their lunch, and they quite liked it. But I re- what I was doing there was that same thing. You realise you, you, I was sort of banging my foot to give you a, a thing. Now, that might be too much for some people in the small circumstances, but for the styling of music I was doing, I realised that was it was part of it. My foot was as much... I should perhaps get a special tray that I sort of... That, mag- that amplifies the foot that you sort of bash. I mean, in, the Sp- in, in, the, in a lot of those Spanish uh, groups, they have, you know, they have like percussion that they sit on and play and that, those sort of things. And I suppose that, 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 that I, I suppose it's like that really, or skiffle or something. No, it is. It is. It's that kind of cajon feel of, you know, what you're sitting on and becomes a drum. But I think you should, Jules, I think you should really try that. I think you should try to amplify it and then see what can be done in post-production to kind of make it really, really part yes. of the groove in a new way. That could be a really exciting way forward. I agree. And also, I've never, I hadn't thought, you're right, it could. And also, you have special footwear. Not quite like little Titch, the musical person who had <laughs> shoes that were sort of um, five feet long, but you know that sort of. Um, but I think you're right. Having special shoes with special soles made, you know, perhaps one foot with a, a sort of snare drum and another one with a hi hat or something. You know, it's it's a there's a whole a whole uh, method. But it's interesting, I think, the way. I mean, that's a different way of approaching lots of different sorts of music. And I so I often wonder, and perhaps you might know this better than I, but when you hear say some classical music i mean some is clearly meant to be uh um played is the right word for it romantically when it's not when it's not played but it's just played sort of uh, almost color voce in and out of, of thing or or whether it's played like really on the beat and i and i i'm never quite sure, you know when the when whoever it was i mean some pieces of music are clearly meant to be romantic and some people pieces are more on the beat but because you will never hear say um, Bach, as an example, because I like him playing the piece of music, you don't really know what he meant. Which, you know how 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 in rhythm could because it could be in rhythm or as loose as you want, really. And people say, oh, well, he wrote instructions on it, but I mean, yeah, well, what did it sound like when he did it? Nobody knows, so you can make it up, and it sounds all right. Well, no, that's right. But the thing is, Bach is also um, a big crush of mine. And um, I I think I have bestowed upon my children that same love for this this amazing human being. Of course, we don't know. And I think what's interesting about um, getting older is that I feel like I've gone through a whole lot of fashions of how people feel that Bach may have intended it to be. So you've got all sorts of different styles in there. Um, and certainly when I was a student, you could be as romanticized in your style as you wanted. You could really just kind of pull it around and then it became much straighter with um, the folks saying, look, we're really getting into um, uh, more authentic Baroque um, performance practices. And now I think that we're moving into a, another era, which is just saying that, you know, there, if Bach is so great, if Bach is so great, then perhaps anybody can interpret him in whatever way. But as far as defining the beat is concerned, I think it's interesting because as classical players and um, teaching people to play classically, um, I'm really trying to get a sense of um, an inner metronome so that they don't thump the foot down in a way that really adds to your groove. It's just so interesting because it's horses for courses, really. Um, So the inner metronome is 
is a very, very important thing. Um, but, you know, when Jacob and I are listening to music together, he'll often say, where do you feel the one? And it can be a really interesting thing because he'll say, but look, you can feel it in this way. And, oh, you can turn it on its head and it can be like that. So the idea that there is a form and maybe we're all used to hearing and feeling in 4-4, but actually with all your syncopation that you're doing and with all the sense of rubato or different styles, you can actually feel the beat anywhere or nowhere. And, and how, do you go, how do you go about trying to instill in your um classical people your musicians who are learning classical music to how do you to, how do you get or any of us to uh because i'm i'm a student too i think you know a, 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 any wise person realizes they're all a student but they but how would you get how would you instill how would you advise me as well as your student to instill and then a metronome how would you go about learning that well there are lots of different ways but the thing is you know you're the absolute expert of the inner metronome because you've had your band all these years and you're going to count them in or you're going to say something or you're going to you're going to you're going to do something with your body that says you know exactly what the tempo is going to be so that the drummer who you do have there um is going to really understand what's going on and it's going to be absolutely finey ho so you've already got that inner metronome if you can feel that in there and you're bringing in your band so you don't need me to tell you that but i think when we're setting when we're setting speeds for anything at all you got to think um how fast you're rocking those those swung semiquavers because you've got to have a clue about that before you set your tempo at the beginning otherwise you're going to be up the kyber aren't you so the yeah. idea is not to just think I can think and I can think of a I can think of a groove and I can say how fast that is in, in a kind of a metronomic beat. It's much more to do with look at the style of what you're playing and think about the most complex rhythmic rhythmical part that you can in there, and imagine that in your head as being something that already exists before you're giving the band that that beat that counting. Okay, you're already thinking how it's going to feel, whatever it's going to be, and oh yeah, I can get my chops around that that's absolutely fine uh, this feels okay this still feels relaxed to me when i hear it in my head boom we've actually got it and i mean i suppose there's also the other kind of thing of um it's quite fun to get the metronome out and to say you know i think this is 80 oh maybe it's 82 what do you reckon and if you keep on doing that every day then you've got an absolute way of being able to pull um tempos out of the sky so that if i'm conducting an orchestra and i can see it's got a metronome mark of whatever it happens to be i've got a way of calculating that so i can give approximately what i think yeah, the yeah. composer would have intended in that situation yeah i'm, teach I'm teaching no, that's good. i think that's I think a very good i mean but i think it's, it's all of that stuff actually that's that's um, that I mean, more and more, you know, we start when we do a take. I was in, this, we were in the studio last week doing takes or something, and we thought, well, if the bat, it might move slightly as you're halfway through it, but it doesn't matter as long as you start at the same tempo. So you make a note of what the tempo was what yeah. felt good, and then you'd always, if you always start at the same tempo, the whole thing would sort of, it would stay more or less the same, but it might just twitch slightly. But that's all right because that's you know, it gets a bit more excited here or not there. And it's it's interesting that if but once you make a note of what those tempos are, they sort of do sort of sort of lodge in your mind, and you think, well, actually, maybe this, is a little bit, and it, and you can hone them down a bit by paying attention to what the, the numbers were, which I never used to do. I have to say, I used to be think, oh, let's make that a little bit faster or a bit slower, but not without without putting any uh, BPMs on it. And it's now quite, I sort of think, you know, yeah, it's quite interesting. It's, I find it more helpful to be able to do that. It is. I think it is more helpful. Um, I mean, you could say, cool, it's a bit fussy, isn't it? You're just sort of writing in stuff. But I'm a real advocate of writing stuff down all over music, because I think that once I've put stuff down like a BPM or a, a Boeing or a fingering or whatever, then the next day I can just look at that and I can just think, that was absolute rubbish and I really don't know why I even put that in there. But it gives me something to go against or it gives me something to work with. And then you think, mm. actually, now I really realise in the cold light of day and it's a bit warmer today, it's not so frozen and my fingers are feeling different, that I don't feel like that at all. So I really like it as a basis. So when I see music or, or parts or anything, even chord symbols that haven't got stuff just written all over them, I feel a bit uncomfortable, really, because I think it's great to have that basis. In the same come on you're a you love landscape painting it's really lovely once you've actually got 
the paint on the canvas, isn't it? It's what, lovely once you begin in there, then you're not frightened to, you're not so frightened. It's not the blank canvas where you're just thinking, shoot, here we go. Oh, okay, got to make that first, got to make that first thing. But once it's on there, then you can edit it. By the way, talking about your painting, are you really going back, um, you know, all those centuries and working in authentic materials? Are you know, are you an oil man, for instance? No, I'm. I, no, so I'm not. I just I do a tiny bit of sketching just for my own pleasure. I'm not. Uh, uh, but it's not like I'm each day out in the studio with the sort of the canvas there and and um, out in there marching off through the landscape with my no i do it for my own pleasure i do quite a lot of architectural drawing because i make little buildings and things and so uh, there's a lot of rulers and uh, but also it's i suppose the architectural drawing is because it's again how the light plays against the different planes of architecture that i suppose i found interesting um but uh, but and also but by doing my modest sketch sketches it helped me understand all the more when you saw the paintings that were really great. And I think when I, the paintings that I really like, they, uh, what they do is they allow you, me to be transported in time. And I think that's quite extraordinary. Once you start looking at the, some of the paintings, I was particularly, um, you, you know, some of the, certainly some of the early uh, late medieval paintings, particularly <laughs> great because the backgrounds of them, you see the world in which they exist. You'll mm. see a shoe or a, their knife and fork and you'll suddenly realize the people were very they're the same as us and you're you're and the more you look at the background before you look at the foreground you're you're transported into that time and place and and so that's yeah i think that's but that's um that's a, my own little private hobby so i don't i don't i don't work i do a few i've not really done oil painting because you i don't yeah that takes that you know perhaps one day I will, but I think that takes a bit more um, time than I've got. So I, might, I might do a little sketch of something just wherever I am because that's quick. But I think the oil painting suddenly out, out comes the easel and the canvas. And then you I did do it once. Actually. I went on holiday. Uh, so we, I went with some people on holiday in Switzerland to go skiing. I didn't really like skiing. So I stayed in my room and I thought I was going to fall over and hurt my hands or something. Anyway, so I stayed in my room with somebody else and we did sketching out of the window. And we sketched the Matterhorn. And on that occasion, I did try using oils. And I got oil paint all over the carpet and got a, a, a sort of triple bill because <laughs> because of the mess I'd made. So yeah, that was my one sort of um, uh, um, uh, sort of little de delving into uh, oil painting. So it was one thing after another. Not only did I not really like the skiing, but then I got a huge bill because of the carpet. But there we are. Yeah, but was it worth it? Ish. I mean, my, the oil painting. I think you need to like anything. I mean, I do think with music, for instance, if you've got a gift for music and then you can play. For instance, you would be able to, or I've seen Jacob do it. If there's an instrument you're not familiar with at all and you pick it up or a keyboard that has like some sort of sound that you don't know and you press a button and something, whatever comes out straight away, you'll get something out of that as you're making friends with that instrument or that sound or whatever it is or some sort of thing um, that could be really great because it will be your naive take on that instrument. Oh, completely, yes. So I think that's, so I, so I think in, and, 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 and I always liked Duke Ellington's view that everybody makes their own music. It's not like one person, he's the best or she's the best or they're great. Or, it's like everybody makes their own music and it's and that's what it is. It's wonderful everybody makes their own music and their own music might just be that person that hums as he walks or she walks down the road or, you know, or, or, or taps a drain type pipe um, uh, with spoons. It doesn't matter. It's all part of the same Thing, or somebody who's an incredible constant pianist it doesn't matter it's all the same uh uh thing that you're plugging into so i think that but it's, it, is, it is interesting when you pick up an instrument you don't really know something great will come out of it with oil paints which is a medium i didn't really know it was a bit i think that was, that was going to be a bit more of a study i think if i'd have gone into the abstract world i could have done that but i'm not good enough to go into the abstract world i think you have to be really great to do that and that's a, that's a whole you have to really go you have to be able to do you, you, if you could do a Rubens, then you could do a great abstract. You know, I've got a couple of friends who are great abstractists, and they're, they're really great. But you have to be able to be Rubens first. You can't just start there. 
I think I agree with you, but it's quite interesting because with the music, you're saying, actually, we can play a keyboard and we're stumbling upon something. And just by being curious and not really knowing what you're doing, you've stumbled upon something that's really lovely. But you're saying that um, with the art to do an abstract, which I guess is a similar kind of thing of experimenting, actually, you need to be able to do a Rubens first of all. Yes, although I, um, I say that, but... Uh... And I do think that in art and music, really, there aren't any rules. Actually, is that that is rule number one? There is no rules um, yeah. because, you know, I'm saying that. But I think you can just do whatever you want. Really, I think that's the great thing about it. You can, and some, and and somebody completely naive, it, it, with a naive understanding of music, can come up with something that's so beautiful it will make you weep. Or, for instance, the most. The 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 um, um, my mother's dear friend, uh, who I used to go and stay. She was I called her an aunt, but she wasn't. She but she was like one. But she plays uh, just bark at home, not in a not in a. And she what she's like just in a amateurish for her own pleasure. But that's the best. Like that's when she when I first heard her playing that. I've never heard it any better because when I thought it was like whoa, that's the best thing ever. What is that? And she said, well, it's not me. It's this great music I'm playing. But actually, the way she played it. That was, a, that was, you know, I can't ever, I, I've never heard anybody do it better. And I listened to all the records of everybody, you know, because you, it's the moment and the person that connects the music at that. You say, it says, there was all those other things like the time, the place, the, when you discover something and all those things, you know. So, you know, basically, if you're working with somebody, does it make a difference to you how they actually give the music? I mean, obviously, you've, you've worked with so many zillions of people and so many people have come across you and, and love you for what you do, but you've had the opportunity to really see how people work. And does it make a difference? Does it make a difference how the gift is given, how something is actually played, how meaningful it is? Yeah, well, I think... I think I suppose it's got I do think there's something in the attitude with which something is played. Mm. I think there is something in that. Uh, and I do think that you've got to love what you play and you've got to play what you mean. Um, and, and you've got to mean what you play. You can't, you know, you've got to be committed to it. I thought I, I heard you on one of your which I thought was really great that you said, you know, you just commit to one note. Think about it before you yeah. do it and commit to it. And a lot of people don't do that and they don't realise you've got to, it's not just about singing the song, it's about really, with great singers, I've, I've realised this, they inhabit the song. I've seen people, um, they'll start off with their learning, even like a great singer has to learn a song. And they'll, you know, and I did one, it, was, it sounded like a boast, but it did happen. So Tom Jones covered a song I did and he came to the studio and when he first did it, it was like, and then after sort of five or six takes, as he learnt it in the studio and was learning it, he then, it, instead of, he inhabited it and possessed it and also completely be believed it and therefore made you believe it um, as a piece. And I think people sometimes think it's, they see somebody singing or performing and they don't really think there's anything more to it. But then some people, when they perform, they're, they're not doing anything more than that. They're just, they're not really perhaps, they're not, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but that doesn't, I don't think it'll communicate the music so well. You have to have an attitude of, and sometimes the attitude is one of, you know, it's kind of might be, you know, it's, it's lots of different attitudes you have, but I think you've got to have, you've got to have belief in it and, and then it'll, 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 and you've got to love it, what you're playing, and then it will work, you know, I think. Okay, well, I agree. You've got to have belief and you've actually got to love it. And coming back to your idea of right at the very beginning, you've also got to be in the present when you do it. And so I agree. Yeah. Um, but then if you're in a situation where somebody's saying, come on, Jules, just sit down at this, um, this old Joanna here and, and pull us out of tune, and you're not really in the mood, you might not actually be able to feel it in quite the way that you might have been able to do on another day but it does it does that mean that it's still not worth giving or is it something is it is it something that well, is well, worth well hearing that's a good no that's a good question and actually curiously enough about five years ago um i i do tours in europe some of them with my big band but some of them with a small band uh where we do smaller theaters and 
clubs and things, which I, um, I just have, I have three singers and just a, a drummer playing quiet percussion. Um, I do that really because, partly because of the economics of playing in slightly smaller places, but also because uh, it was very good exercise for my fingers. And, for you know, it's, it, if you've got a big band, it's easy to not hide behind them, but not, you know, you you, 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 you can relax. You don't have to. There's a lot of you there. Yeah. You have the whole rhythm section going on. You mm. don't have to mm. give your whole. And I thought I wanted to keep in trim. And I think part of what I remember, realised, about five years ago we were doing one of these in a place called Rosenheim. And it was a fill-in show that the promoter had got. And it was like it was like a sort of it wasn't it wasn't like a German working men's club, but it was sort of a strange sort of place where lots of I don't know, uh, and I don't mean this in a mean way, but a lot of middle management people went for their drinks after dinner. That's no, or, oh, no, before dinner, it. before dinner, right? Anyway, yeah. so anyway, it's a crowd. And this particular evening, um, Louise Marshall, who's a wonderful singer, had a friend of hers who was a harmonica player. He said, "Oh, he's here. He wants to get up with us." Okay, yeah, that's great. And he was great, fan, wonderful. And I think we did uh, two sets. So we started to sort of do one and there was a lot of people talking and it was like, you couldn't, you thought, you know, but I thought, and I suddenly got this thing. I thought I'm determined to win this because I remember when I, we first started with, with before squeeze me and the guitar player and squeeze, we'd go into pubs and we'd, we, you'd fight and you win them. Yeah. So it's almost like you have to be, you do have to be a boxer almost as well. Yeah, Hoping that you'll just, you can just play the music and everybody will think you're wonderful isn't always going to work. Sometimes you have to be, and I, I you, you know, and I, and I suddenly had this thing, this is five years ago, I suppose, maybe four years ago, where I thought, no, and I really kind of like, really wouldn't let it alone. Like, I'm really kind of <laughs> going to drive this. And by the end, and it was hard work, they were all going mad. Because I was really kind of driving like, well, well, we'll pull this one out of the bag now. Let's see, you know, really throwing all the energy into it. But it worked. And I was really pleased. I felt like I was a bit like an old boxer, sort of a prize fighter, who'd been pushed into sort of doing the security on some rotten pub in the old Kent Road, <laughs> but had still managed to sort everybody out. And I, was, I felt so pleased because I thought, well, it doesn't, you can't blame the audience. It's not their fault. They're just there. And you, but you've got to sometimes just do your best and try and win. Not every time. There are going to be some times when you just can't win. But but really, if you stick with it, and and you do have to sort of... I remember Mary Lou Williams saying, you have to love what you play, but you also have to love the people you're playing. To. I know. So no matter, now, no matter how annoying that, I think, well, I'm going to know, I'm going to win you. You're not going to... I'm not going to let you go. And that was an interesting experience. And I was pleased to be able to do that because I haven't had to do that for a long time. I'm normally going on, everybody's there to see you and they're really pleased mm. to go on having to to work hard to win a crowd but it's very good practice i remember when the big band first started we had one musician who came and they were aghast that people weren't sitting and listening and it was a dark we were play, you know and i remember dear old rico our um our uh trombone trombone trombonist um saying to them and they were quite upset that people weren't listening and they were sort of dancing and he said but he said, don't worry, it is a dance. That's what he said. Sometimes we play dances. You know, sometimes you play, uh, there's all different sorts of things for music, but dancing is another part of it. It's all right. You're just, don't worry. Um, you know, and of course that's all right. It's not always a concert situation. A concert situation, you know, sometimes it does want to be that. Sometimes you're playing something that doesn't demand that. But it's quite good practice, I think. It was good practice. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it every night, but to have to win people over, I think, you know, and, and really sort of, and, and and engage with them more, you know, because ultimately you want people to connect with the music that you're playing and feel the same things as you're feeling when you're playing them and to connect that. And it's an incredible gift music because when you're doing that, you can, you're not using any words, well, unless you're singing a song, but you can do it with just playing music. You can get the, you can communicate exactly how you're feeling without saying words to somebody else in a different language or whatever, and they can just feel that. And it might mean they're going to have a dance or just feel that, that thing. And that's an incredible thing to do. But you are trying to win a crowd. So it's all right. It's no good trying to sort of fight the crowd because that's never going to work, I don't think. Well, we've all done those function gigs of many years ago. And you just sort of, you're, you're all there and you're all thinking, well, no one's listening to this at all. And I think, I think back to my dear dad. We both had dads called Derek, by the way, which is really nice. Very good. I know. Son, and <laughs> son and daughter of Derek. Great. <laughs> like, seriously. Um, but he would just say to me, 
you know, you don't judge who's in the audience. You have no idea who's in the audience. And this might be a function gig. And there might be one person there who completely gets what you're trying to convey when you play that phrase. And, you know, you could be just playing to that person in the room. Then you're, if you're lucky, yeah, you can ignite the whole lot. And that's really lovely. But as you that, say, it doesn't always happen. So you can't judge it. You can't judge your audience. As you say, you, they, you don't know why they're there. They, don't, they didn't even know there was going to be music, you know? Yeah, and Derek had a very good point there. But also, you don't know what people's stories are. You might be playing. I remember we, we did something. Actually. I remember doing something with Sam Brown. But it, it wasn't, it was like, it, it was like a, I mean, people knew who we were, so they were enjoying our show. But it was like it was a—it wasn't a concert situation. It was like a stand-up, some sort of a do. But she sang one song, and there was a person back, and they were crying. I thought, oh, you know, they must have. Well, who knows? You don't know what's what's happening no. in people's lives. You know, they might have all sorts of awful things happening, and the music that you play might do something to really kind release. of lift them up or yes. release that thing. So you never know who's going to be out there. And uh, Derek's absolutely right. So Derek had the best advice, which is. You know, you never know who's there. So, and and if you just communicate with one person, that's enough. And actually, that's what Mary Lou Williams. So I go back to only because she was had a lot quite a good little sort of. Like she did teaching, but her, her wisdoms were quite good, similar to yours, and Derek's. But she said, you know, if you're if you're having a show and you find and it's like it's kind of a tricky crowd, just find one person who's like enjoying it and play yeah, to them. Absolutely. And then they said that that will then it's kind of that will, it'll become a bit contagious because they'll then sort of add to you know, the next person will pick up and the next person will pick up. But it is very strange when you think about it because it is like a form of you're hypnotising both yourself with the music and other people. Uh, I say hypnotising, but it's, your, or your, it's, it's weaving a spell on you and them at the same time. And it's quite a strange thing to do, really. It's quite, a, it's quite it? an abstract thought. It is an abstract thought, but I think to make it quantifiable, I'd still say it's about being absolutely present in what you're doing. Yeah. Just really, you're feeling every single note and phrase. And in fact, you've still got some space um, in your mind to just kind of think about the rest of the phrase and how you're just going to caress that at the end and how you're going to bring that off before you do the next thing. And that's just, it's the same thing. It's all about just being absolutely here in the moment and not thinking about, actually not thinking about whether they're going to love it, but it's about really giving it so genuinely and really hoping that you can move somebody in there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's, and that's the, 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 and you, and I don't think you can hope to move anybody with music unless you, you've moved yourself. You, if you see what I mean, unless you felt it, then you can't hope to get somebody else to feel it. But you see, that's the thing that, again, my Derek um, would say to me that it's not a, it's not a really cocky thing to just say, I really enjoyed the sound that I made. You've got to actually know when you do make a good sound so that you yeah. can kind of hone that and develop it and, and, and make it into your own voice in there. Um, so I still think it's interesting that you have to play on all sorts of different instruments, but you still want to convey your own voice. I mean, how difficult was it to find your own voice as a pianist, never mind being a band leader and a TV presenter and everything? How difficult was it for you to find your own voice as a pianist? I think for me, it's probably been my limitations which have have made it, have made my, have given me my voice. And I think that, you know, pianists, for instance, all have, you can, I can, you know, lots of people, I can tell it's them. Mm. Uh, the, 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 a lot of the, the jazz or the blues pianists who I've listened to, I say studied. Um, I, I think loved would be a better word, yeah. you know, uh, but that's, but that, but it, which is, but it was the same thing. You know, I'll know them. I'll know their sound. And I think sometimes you can recognise, I would hope that you could recognise it's me in, a, in, in my jangling style of whatever that is. Um, because, and you listen to the, the, I listen to the people I love, they have certain phrases, certain expressions they'll use, much as people do in conversation or whatever. And I hope that I've got those that are, uh, are, are recognisable. So, and the thing is, it's like, I remember, again, going back to Mary Lou Williams, they said, you know, um, uh, they said to her, you know, you're, um, what piano players do, do you like? And she talked about a couple of teachers she'd had early on. And they said, oh, what about Art Tatum? She said, well, I wouldn't want to sound like him. I mean, he's a great piano player, but I don't yeah. want to sound like him. I want to sound like me. Mm. And I think that's it. You, but you, you, you end up sounding like you by, pra by not practicing. I don't mean practicing to try and play well, but, but by the art of practicing your, your music everywhere in public, you hone down what is your style. And for me, I think it's, you know, I'll do things because that feels comfortable for me to do. That's right. Um, yeah. Not 
Uh, and that's what's, what's been comfortable for me to do. And what makes sense for me um, might not make sense for somebody else, but I think that's what gives you. And so I suppose I've got a jangled up thing of, of all the different people I've been listening to and the things that I've liked. And then it comes out in your own way. I mean, it's a bit like, I remember Keith Richards saying, well, he, would, he was trying his hardest to sound like Chuck Berry, but actually what come, comes out is the Rolling Stones, which is probably, <laughs> you know, and which is better for him. You yeah. know, it's no good if he sounded just like Chuck Berry because somebody's already been Chuck Berry. Um, and it's like you can study people, but if you come out, if you if you sound it exactly the same, well, you're never going to sound exactly the same, but it comes out differently. I think more as well, I think, you know, for instance, I think you listen to, I listen to like some old, really old jazz records, which I like very much. And then you listen to somebody like uh, Louis Armstrong. And, it, it, you know, I, I find that his, that, that starts to come out, some of his phrasing and things in my piano playing, just what, what listening to him, because there's something that, uh, that, that has to, creates a spark. But then going back to the Derricks, uh, my Derrick, um, so when I was growing up, I, was interested in uh you know i like sort of pop records and i like the blues and boogie woogie records because that's what i was listening to um but my derrick was he very much he liked classical music and liked um and 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 jazz so he was very good at, at introducing me to things mm. that he thought would be slightly more challenging mm. i remember him, him getting me a, a record by frederick goulder called the long road to freedom and frederick goulder was this austrian great concert pianist who decided he was going to give it all up and play jazz um and it was which is sort of fascinating and he, he he does a whole sort of 15 minute version of light my fire or something but in getting that and i listened to the record the other day and it is kind of great it's quite it's he's austrian it's quite germanic and quite serious mm. it's not it's quite sort of like sort of uh, yeah. as frederick Gould is but it is great i listened to it again and i thought I could see how that probably had an effect on me and took me to a different place. So I think what I learned from my Derek is you've got to be open to sort of things to, that you've not been listening to mm -hmm. and, uh, and not be, uh, and also my Derek, a friend of mine was coming, came around and he was, he was playing a Bessie Smith record and I, he, and, and I really love Bessie Smith as well. And he was saying, and, uh, and, um, and this friend of mine, we were teenagers, just sort of, uh, and my and my Derek said to my friend, "What do you think of that?" He said, "It's a bit before my time." And my Derek became a bit sort of sort of not cross, but a bit put out by that. He said, "But mo everything's before your time, you know. Whether it's Beethoven or a record that was made last week, you know. When when is what what isn't? There's nothing that's after your time. You won't have heard it. So what what are you talking about? You know." Um, and I think that's the thing with music. I think people are, but people get frightened of some classical music and jazz music. They get frightened of some music. Um, and when they hear it, or if they, and I can see if you hear the wrong bit and find it too challenging, you get in, if you jump straight into the deep end, it can be too much for people sometimes. But some of the greatest things and the, and the most extraordinary things will be those things, and they'll sort of keep with you. And I find those, it's those recordings, that's what I've sort of learned from my day, is a lot of those things that were really great, whether it's classical music or jazz records and things, you go back to them now, and uh, as a person who's now much older, I go back to them and they've, they've, they've grown in stature. Mm. You hear more in them. Mm. You hear something you thought, oh, I thought that's what they were doing. They weren't doing that at all. It's something quite different. Mm. Blimey, I never understood that. That's so uh, extraordinary what they're doing. You see more in them uh, than you do in the records at the time that I thought were quite good because I was 16 and liked some record at the time. You listened to that and there wasn't so much in it. Not, you know, and sometimes, having said that, some of the, not, not, not to dismiss, by the way, pop music or because it's fantastic it's like one of the greatest art forms there are but it's interesting how those old recordings that were thought to be great of things yes. the reason people thought they were great is because there is often something really great about them and it's worth investigating I, if you find an artist or a composer you like the more you look the more you'll find you know but don't you think it's interesting that your Derek and my Derek would have um got out the record player and it would have been a 78 or a you know 45 whatever it happened to be um and uh the record would be put on and you know we'd be told you know and this is by so and so and just sit down and have a listen and it wasn't like um i don't like this after 10 seconds i'm going to switch it off and just see what else i can find on spotify that's just going to um ring my bell you sat down and you committed to it. However you felt about it, you know, it was given to you. Maybe it was a challenge. Maybe it was something different. Maybe it was just something that was delighting our Derricks. 
But we were so lucky yes. because we actually sat in there. And I think in the same way that musical tastes have changed in terms of how to interpret, say, Bach or anybody, I think our listening tastes have really, really been altered by the way that we consume. And I'd really love to know how it feels um, being you now with your Spotify and you go into Spotify and uh, you listen to people and how much are you how much are you exploring and um, going to the song radio of the song that you like and just sort of seeing what other what other songs are like the one that you're listening to? How much of that do you do? Or do you still do like, it in a very old school kind of let's actually get an album and commit and listen to it? No, I don't, well, I, there's two things there. So one, because I'm often working with lots of different people and I'm looking at this and do this song, do this version of a song by somebody, and I would do this, this. It means that my Spotify, which it makes me happy as well, uh, because often when I'm listening to Spotify, what I'm listening to is a lot of people not getting paid, quite frankly. But anyway, that's, that's, <laughs> that's another, another story. But, um, but, uh, but, what, uh, but, but what I, because my, I'm putting in these things that are not related to one another at all, the music, because it's 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 not in a particular genre, because it might be somebody who's coming on the show or somebody who's I've got to learn a song for. It, it, it means that that whatever whatever I put in to find what I might like is too is too much. So I quite enjoy messing its its, it's algorithm up. That's that's that. that um, and also I quite like it because I've got quite a lot of things that aren't on Spotify. That makes me even happier when I've got something that isn't. Having said that, the convenience of it. The fact you somebody rings up and says, "I mean, it's it, as an example that's a, of the modern world." Um, Amy Winehouse, we recorded "Monkey Man," the Toots and the Maytel song with her. She said, "Will you learn that, Jules?" Yeah. So we learnt it. She got there and she said, "No, that's not the version I meant." Oh. But we met anyway. We managed to change it to the version she was. But we'd all spent sort of a day learning this one. But it, but nowadays you say it's this particular version. And instead of having to go to my record collection and get the one version that I've got and then make a cassette and send it, all of that stuff, you just all make sure you've got the right one and you can you can learn it. So from that point of view, and from a comparison point of view, you can go, well, there's, you know, there's this song. I know, it's amazing. Yeah, and you can hear every version. You think, And I thought I had a lot of records, but on there, you, oh, you know, quite often there's one or two missing that they don't have. Not everything's on there, but there'll be a lot. And that, that helps kind of, so from a learning process, that, that's pretty good. When it comes back with saying things, you're like this because you like that, it's often because I was looking up a song that somebody wanted to learn by somebody who I wasn't particularly going to be listening to, whoever it was. I won't name names. So it'll say you're probably like that. And I thought, well, no, I won't. <laughs> it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. But so I think uh, that, that I'm fortunate that I'm having that, you know, so that's for, sort of for, almost for a work thing. I think listening to records, though, I still buy CDs because... I listen to them if I was sketching or if I was, I need to find, or if I'm be, if I, I need to find a space to be quiet, you know, then I will, be, and I like to listen to a whole record and I do enjoy that. And I make notes on the back of the record. Um, and, um, uh, which, and I had a, a show where I used to play a lot of old blues records, which on the radio, which I don't do at the moment, but I'm thinking of starting a podcast, but I've got literally hundreds of feet of, 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 you know, blues and soul and, and scar and, and jazz records marked with an interesting story and also how it all into one thing connects with another you know the longer it goes on you can never put all of the ends together i mean the same with classical music as well as oh you didn't realize so and so was the pupil of so and so or he liked so and so she was totally. working with so yeah. oh she sang with him and then went off with it you know it's all of that it's <laughs> so there's always another another story you know that goes on and and people I mean, do like the human story. People like, you know, I, I remember somebody saying about artists, you know, the reason people like, people are interested in, in sort of uh, in Lucian Freud or Rembrandt or Tracy Emin as examples of artists, that there will be, that what, the, what you're interested in is them because their personalities are very strong. That's the thing I've, I've, I've realised with, with visual art. It's, and then, you know, uh, and, and then because you're interested in them, you're interested in their work. Yes. And I think it's certain there's a certain amount of truth in some of the musicians and, uh, and artists as well, you know, there because and some of you know particularly you know getting on for whatever it is ninety hundred years ago, people's lives were everywhere so much harder, you know, both classical music and and you know you've got a world war going on. There's people, you know, whew, you know you've got poverty, you've got slavery, all this stuff going on. People living amongst that and music mm. coming out of it. 
Um, and um, but and strong personalities come out of that. And I think that that's people are interested. I think that what can often draw people to the music is the personality of somebody. And that's, I don't think that hurts, you know. I don't think that hurts at all. But I think it's interesting that, you know, we've talked about past and present an awful lot of the time. But I think, you know, when you were starting out in TV, actually learning how to present, learning your craft, you've actually had to see the face of TV change so hugely and I really want to know whether you feel that your craft has changed or whether you feel that um, what is being wanted by the audience has changed or what has changed through all these decades of your work just sort of being being on on that box that so much of the time we're so used to seeing you but how's it been for you going through an enormous um, technical shift really I, th I think the probably the big shift I, th I think well the thing is if we just started with me, I mean, my, my, my work is, is you know, 95% of it is all to do with music on the television. And I think that what um, uh, what somebody said to me, if you just think about music, you know, the way they sell music, the way it's, you know, you, you, it used to be records and it was CDs and then it's now it's people get it when they think it's for free on their phone or whatever. Mm. Um, uh, but the but the uh, the core and, and and when they go in they don't record it on tape now they record it on something digital. But the core of what of what music is, which is somebody playing something they really believe some way in whichever it might be electronically or whatever. But they're playing where right, they record their music. If they're going to sing, they have to use a microphone. That technology hasn't changed for a hundred years, uh, and it comes back for a speaker. And that technology hasn't changed for a hundred years. Um, those elements of it are the same and i think the music on television people say oh we're going to reinvent this well you don't really want to reinvent it there's nothing to reinvent it's no. like you're trying you can't if you you might make it sound better you might make it sound worse you might make the but that you you know with uh, you might make it look a little bit crisper but does that make it look but do, do you really want to see it, the, the, it waltz and all was it better when it was slightly f yeah. fussy and all of that you know so um I, I think generally the thing if it was drama i'd say it's different you know, not that I'm involved in that world really, because drama becomes probably more violent and more sexy, uh, or whatever. It has, to, you know, that's probably have to. But with the music and 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 maybe news is the same. They have to be. That's different to how the news was presented twenty or thirty years ago, or something like when I started on the television. But but music isn't so so different because music itself isn't so different. Artists come through. Um, there are, uh, I think. Um, what has changed in the technology, of course, is YouTube. So when uh, an artist performs, say, on our show, it used to be, if we were lucky, we'd get maybe a million people see our show, say, mm. just as an example. Um, uh, uh, and tele music television has never been hugely high rating. It's never been high rated. No. It has a, a bit, a, but it always has a, a committed audience but it's a, uh, and it's a committed audience as well which i don't think has changed which is very diverse it's men it's women it's people of all ages from all parts of uh, i'm talking about in this case um, britain in particular it reaches all parts of, of the country in all sorts of demographics which means whether they're sort of um, skin or they've got a few quid it, yeah. may, it, it reaches them all yeah. uh, in a very mixed way whereas some programs don't some programs reach a certain demographic That's true. music That's is very, very mixed yeah. and it never has huge numbers no matter what you do it's not it's never it's some of the pops used to but that was a slightly different idea but um or the competition shows do but, the, but any music shows that aren't that um or have a certain limited thing but youtube changed that entirely because then when the as an example, so our show would go out, a million people would watch it, and on it you'd get a performance by, um, say, Amy Winehouse. I'll just use her as an example again. But on, on that show, so a million people would see that, and that was good. And it used to be that that was the end of it. But now, with YouTube, uh, that that same Amy performance will have had 15 million people oh, watch yeah. it. Mm. And, and it goes on and on and on. It, it, it go, is it exponential or whatever the right word for it is. It, goes, it, it keeps growing. It doesn't yeah. stop. It has, uh, it has this huge tail to it, and so that's what's really changed. Um, and um, and people, I think, people's attention span is slightly shorter, but 
their appetite for music and I think or also their and it's people say oh you there's never been so much choice people are confounded by choice they need help guiding through to what's interesting to listen to I think that's probably always been the case really mm. you know there's always been a lot of stuff you don't know people don't know where to begin my tour manager who has great taste in music I have to say when he was a teenager he thought I better get into music so he went to the record shop and but I have the number one album, the one one single, because if they're the most popular, this must be good. Yeah. And he hated both of what he, he hated them both. Yeah. Because <laughs> it doesn't work like that. No. It works on a different sort of it works with your own thing. But I think the, but people now still want to be led by things. But that's really the difference, I suppose, that um that it's uh that it, and I think it also used to be slightly more chaotic than it is now. And had more money to spend on it. Television generally did, um, but because now it has a lot of competitors. There's not yes. just there's lots of cable. There's lots of different. There's, a, there's a, lots of ways you can watch stuff, and people don't watch the television like they used to. We all tune into. I mean, the one of the good things about I did the program, the Tube, is everybody tuned into it, and you felt you were part of something, yes. and you saw something on it. Although the program might have been a bit chaotic and, chaotic and some nonsense at times, it didn't matter because you'd all watch it together. No, we'd right? all be People, there. It is really true. We were and you'd sort of you, and you yeah. could share. Oh, did you see so and so that? And and you know, did you see? I didn't think much of that. Oh, I like that or whatever. You could do something to discuss the next day. Um, so that was interesting. And I suppose then when you know then later, which has been on, which is going to celebrate its thirtieth birthday, and the Hootenanny, which will also be thirty this year. Um, uh, which there'll be celebrations for, but they, um, I suppose, certainly later took a view. It was a slightly less pop culture wasn't part of it so much. It was more music, mm -hmm. and really, you could have a music show every week, and you would get. If, I mean, we only had used to do twelve shows a year. That's what we're still doing. So we're about to come back, and we'll do twelve shows a year. Really, they should be doing a show every week because there's so much great stuff to get in. Mm -hmm. um, that you can't fit it, fit it all in, um, and I suppose also with the pandemic then we had to come up, we couldn't have artists in a studio anywhere or cameramen or anything. So we did the thing where we have one artist and they'd be in the studio and we'd talk to them about some of their favourite things. And that was interesting because by talking to one person, you realised, I think that was really great actually, because I think somebody would, wouldn't, that artist would often introduce people to art, to other music that they, you introduce the audience to music they wouldn't realise that artists like and they might sort of explore more and i think you realize that artists generally musicians much more broad in their taste in music it's, it's like if they made one genre of music that's not the only thing they listen to and i thought it was great because you sort of learned that from it. i get it but i think coming back to the idea that um in those all those years ago when we watched the tube basically if you were if you were a bit edgy you'd watch the tube and then on the other station, you might be watching something if you were not really like that. But you are right that the communities the next day will be talking about what we what we actually witnessed and what we what we saw, and what we what we heard. And I think there is so much choice now that there isn't that kind of community feel. It's strange to talk about community feel in that kind of a way, but it really was. No, true. but I think but, but but a television program could be that. Uh, um or what the television programmes were sort of that, when yeah. people watched. I think maybe in a funny sort of way, we only do it once a year, so <laughs> not very good for me, but the Hootenanny is a bit like that because lots of people watch that. You know, that if I get into a taxi, the taxi driver says, oh, we, we watch you every yeah. year. <laughs> you know, that's what, which is great. That's so true, I was marvellous. Yeah. Say, say Happy New Year to everybody. But I think that's become a thing. It, it's, it's become a family thing. People don't go out. And they stay in them like they used to. It's, it's you know people don't drink and drive, which is a good thing. They don't, you know. It's it's so. I think there's that. Um, that's the closest thing to a sort of a, a community thing that I do. There are other ones. I think when people watch big sports things together, they feel that they feel as all they're all yeah. one together, you know. Or people or moon landing. <laughs> whenever, <laughs> whenever next time I do that, I hope they'll all tune in. No, I think I think we will all tune in. Um, but it's difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, you say we watch sport together, but, you know, if it's on Sky and you don't have Sky, then you can't be part of that. And it's just not it's not quite the same as just having the three channels or, or the four channels and just yeah, being yeah. able to just just get in there. No, so that, that, that's right. There's a huge choice now. That's the yes. choice has become. And I think the thing that people do like, I suppose the thing that somebody used this word to talk about me and they 
said it about some other people and they said well then you have what's now called authenticity in other words i was making it up as i went along but i was believable mm. um uh and i suppose that's the and i think that when the tube first started the things on the other channels were quite earnest in the way they approached things that's and perhaps nice, we, went, nice we, 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 it, yes. we perhaps we were too went slightly too far the other way but it well, that was all right at the time you know and i think it was about it's, a, it's not like anything it's about sort of trying to get a balance between um uh all the different things that are that are happening i suppose you know the, the yeah the, the artists and the and the, and 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 I think it has to sort of, and it needs to, things need to feel natural. That's the thing, you know, they don't seem to need to feel. So things need to feel natural. So you just talked about authenticity and how, you know, you were kind of making it up as you were going along, but people would say, you know, you're authentic. But I think really what they're really saying is what, again, what we said right at the very beginning, which was all about, you've got to be yourself in there. And I think, isn't this one of the major reasons why people love you and respect you is because you're just Jules. You're just being who you are. You're not going on TV and thinking, I need to be somebody different. You may be making it up as you go along, but you are being so-called authentic. Well, I think um, it's very nice of you to say that they love me. I hope they do. Um, but the uh, but I think that's right. It's it's being me. It's not like I go on and somebody different when the, I might be slightly louder, but it's the same person, basically, you're getting. Mm. It's me. You know, that's right. Um, and I suppose also maybe there's a sense that the that the you know all the musicians that come on are actually really great i would say again although there's no rules to this normally have a great an, an awareness of the stuff that's gone on before them. yeah they have they notch into things from the past mm. not just 10 years in the past but no, like but right in the depth more. of record yeah. right, right, right way into recorded music and i think that's kind of uh i think that and, and often the people who are really great have that that's that's what I've noticed, and I think people maybe understand that uh, that, uh, or maybe there's a sense that, that, that you know when I'm wandering about, blathering on, there's a sense that I do have a, a, a depth, you know, of knowledge of stuff. Yes. Not not actually, it's wrong to say depth. But it sounds like boastful. I mean, an overall knowledge going back with different stuff, you know, um, uh, uh, that that and, and is part of the music. And also, I suppose I'm not. It's not the show isn't about me. I suppose it's about the music. That's the important part. It's I know you're sweet. you're really lucky to have that, or you've made it about the music. But that is so lovely because you're right. It isn't about you. But if we're thinking about spanning the decades, if you go back to Little Jewels um, of all those years ago, what grain or grains of wisdom would you like to have been given that you now know? What would you have liked to have known then? Well, I think the first thing I did, curiously enough, um, think this, and I would have, I, I, and there was a film made about me, maybe about ten years ago now, and we filmed this little bit, which was cut out because it, they, I don't know, they thought it was a bit too weird, it was a bit Dennis Potter like, <laughs> but I did have this experience where I, um, I drove back to the little streets where I lived and it was a very misty atmospheric evening it was sort of maybe a November evening and uh I was going for a drive because I just got this this nice old convertible car and I thought although the hood was up but it was a this old Aston Martin with the roof that came off on it and I thought well I'll just have a little drive to and I drove suddenly I was outside where I used to live and I think oh imagine if if I of me had looked out and seen me yeah. in this, and I would have liked, I'd have think I had a dinky toilet. I think that's why I bought the car, I had a dinky toilet. Or something. Yeah. Normal sort of story. So if I'd have come out and I thought, what would I have done? I would have, I would have said, come over here to the little me that came out, the small Jules. Um, and I'd have said, you know, jump in the car for a moment. And, and then I would have said to him, you know, wow. I said, look, the thing is, don't worry. You know, that's the only thing, don't worry. It was, you know, hard work will kill you, but worry, don't ever won't kill you but worry will so don't worry about anything it'll be it's going to be all right you just think it's going to be all right then at least if it isn't you won't have worried about it in the meantime so i think that's what i i, I sort of thought anyway we, we filmed this we reenacted this and i got my sort of nephew who was small at the time to be dressed as a 1960s <laughs> child and we did the whole thing and i said so yeah the main thing is don't worry and the other thing is don't get into cars with strange men from the future <laughs> and they go but i thought it was too sort of Anyway, it was too weird or something. It's never got cut out, and I thought it was the best bit in the film, but there we were. Um, so, yeah. 
but I suppose don't worry. And also, I'd have said, you know, that 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 um, you know, maybe like anybody probably like listen a bit more to, to people. Really, you know, learn to listen to 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 you know. When I was younger, I think you didn't listen to people so much. Although maybe it sort of went in, you know. Um, but I think that's a natural thing about being young. You sort of, I think that's you know. really true. But being honest with me. Were you a warrior? As a small boy, were you a warrior? Is it actually something that you really did need to hear? No, I, no, I suppose I wasn't a warrior, but it would have been, but uh, but you're thinking, is it, you know, how is it, how, you, I did wonder, how is the life going to work out? I think all probably children think that, you know, is, am I, will I be a, uh, a bus inspector, a milkman, um, an astronaut, mm. uh, the prime minister? Um, you know, what's it, what's it going to go? I don't, I didn't have, I have to say, I suppose also because of my day, I didn't think there were any limitations. I didn't imagine there was anything you couldn't do. No, that's um, nice. But also wasn't going to be put out. I wasn't worried if if, if my if it was something um, simple like, um, you know, being a parking warden. That wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it, but so I was very open-minded about it. But I was—I suppose I was. It would have been nice to tell. So, but I, actually, it would be no good because it would be like somebody coming from the future and telling you, you know, exactly when you're going to drop dead or something, and you think, "Oh, that's <laughs> useful," but then it'd be a bit annoying, you know. Yeah, but I think "Don't worry" is is a is a bigger and more generous, <laughs> lovely, lovely kind of blanket feeling, which you know could have been nice. But then you know, there's Jules as the, the little boy, and then there's Jules kind of right now. But going into the future which we don't have to think about for more than a second because we don't know what's going to happen this time tomorrow. But are you still open to the idea that, you know, perhaps you can still be a milk person or the prime minister? Or do you feel that there are other things that you want to explore in your life to, to kind of give to the world other than what well, you're I, doing? No, I, well, that's a very good question. I mean, I think as you get older, people... Um, I, you know, I think there was. I we did, I did do a television program with Roland River on, and we had a thing about the seven ages of man. I can't quite remember; it's a long time ago. But we had somebody who was from, um, I think, they were they were as a psychologist and somebody from a top advertising agency saying basically, you you know, people, you know, you and you we see it in old paintings. But basically, by a certain age, you know, you, you're not going to be. There's certain things you just sort of know that you're not going to be doing. Um, I don't mean a trapeze and, artist, but maybe no, the... but or, or or prime minister perhaps. Okay, you know, right. um, uh, but 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 I think having said that, you never. I, the other thing I realised, you never know what's around the corner. So many things have surprised me. I never thought, I never dreamed for a moment that I'd have a career in television. No. Uh, you know, when we started. By the time I was sort of 15 or 16, I realised I would have a career in music. And my Derek encouraged me to do that. Yeah. Because he, if he said, it, he said, you're not very good at anything else, so you might as well just do that. <laughs> Although it wasn't going anywhere very specifically, really. But he encouraged me and supported me to do that. Um, and so I thought that's what I was going to do. In like we would do gigs in pubs. And this is, and then also because Squeeze was successful when I was a young, we were young, you know. We were still teen, late in our late teens and, and, and early twenties, and we had all of a sudden we, we the dream had come true. What we thought we were oh, trying yeah. to do, so it gave it gave us a false, a rather false perspective of, of how I thought everything's going to be like this now. You know, we've had three hits and we're all only twenty, so this is we're just going to do this forever now. <laughs> that doesn't quite work out either. But I had no idea. Even though we still thought that's our lives. You know, we're just going to be touring and doing records, and and we'll be like the Rolling Stones or something. You know, but of course it then the TV comes up as well. I never thought I'd have a big band. I never thought I'd have a TV show that would be on forever. So you just never know. So I'm always, you know, you never know what's around the corner. That's the thing. You never know what thing is going to be, is come up, is going to come up to you next. But I suppose there's certain things that I, you know, I won't be now. Uh, I won't be, I won't be a, uh, the uh, uh, train driver. It's too late. I'm past that age. Are you? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I think, yeah, I think, or I think, or, or, or I mean, I, I quite like to have a, 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 one point, I wanted to be a policeman because I wanted to ro race around with a sort of blue light on the oh, car. Oh, no, but, I think we've all been there, yes. Yeah, but but I think you, they all retire when they're sort of um, 30. So, <laughs> so, 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 uh, so no, that is, I can't, there's something I just can't do now. Yeah. No, I get it. Do but it's really... never too late. It's never too late to do anything. I think that would be my important thing. I would say. 
And you never know what's, you really do never know what's around the corner. You can never tell ever what, you know, you might meet somebody, and it, you know, some circumstances change. You just, you know, I'm, I'm, I really am open to that. You just think, you know, even in the last, I was not bore with the details, but in the, even in the last 10 years, things have changed. You thought, well, I never would have thought that, you know, and then it happens, you know, so. But it's, isn't that about being open to possibilities rather than kind of striving and saying, I need to be even more famous and, and well known. It's about actually just saying, I'm open to possibility and really looking at each opportunity that comes our way and, and, and grabbing it and going for it, really. I think that that's exactly grabbing the opportunities. And, and also, you. I think there is something the more you do, the more you're able to do. Uh, somehow That's more lovely, things more things come at you and and also as my Derek used to say there are no problems merely opportunities <laughs> which I think he got out of some <laughs> some American book on how to win friends and influence people or something like that <laughs> no but no problems are only opportunities um um uh you know that's the one way of looking at it but I think you're right you have to be open and like kind of um and also pursuing things that you enjoy because and finding things and some people don't find things they enjoy. But if you think, well, if you enjoy being in your garden or if you enjoy whatever it is, well, try and how can you do that more? Don't exactly. work out you can do it less. Life's short, you know. It's not a rehearsal. I've realised, you know, with, with, with people have said that to me. You know, you've got to. So if something comes up and you think, well, let's do it, you know, uh, and 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 try and do the things that you like rather than things that will kind of you're not really going to like you know if you can try and do the things you like for uh, what i'm saying is i mean i'd rather do things i like um for less money than things i don't like for more yeah no, <laughs> but I'm, i suppose we'd all like to we'd all like to do that <laughs> no i'm really i'm but i'm, I'm very lucky really... i'm lucky because I, I do do what i love doing and i mean like i'm loving talking to you now this is a great opportunity you wouldn't have had uh, uh you know by that's what i mean by the more you do the more you're able to do you know your mother wasn't a june was she no i'm afraid um no she really wasn't she was a, a lila and a wong to boot because um she was chinese canadian so um she wasn't a june but wouldn't that have been lovely that would have been a perfect i have got a friend um who's a, who's a racehorse trainer called julian lloyd and my name is julian jules Ju- is an abbreviation for julian and he's his dad was a derrick and he's a Julian, so we are. When I see him, we are sons of Derek. You can join our. You can join our club. In fact, I insist you do. He's I all think... right, Julian. If you if you if you see Julian Lloyd on Instagram, you'll like him. Actually, he's good. He's uh, yeah, um, yeah. Right, I'm gonna easy. I'm gonna find him in there. It's a bit like being part of a bikers club. I've never been part of a Derek club, and I'd really I'd like to be part of it. So thank you yes. so much. Um, do you know something? We are going to have he so did... many. Go on. He, sorry, he didn't have a. I don't remember going to say this. Julian Lloyd's. That's right. So I just remembered this. His he had. I think his brother, his dad's brother, was called Brian, and so was mine. So I don't know <laughs> if Derek and Brian went together. So there you go. I think it was that 1930s sort of ideal sort of thing. No, it it was indeed. No, um, my Derek was an as only child, and oh. um, yes, born in 27. Um, but. Uh, I'm still part of the Derek Club. Hooray! Yes, exactly. Great. <laughs> that makes me feel just so happy. Um, and I want to say that, you know, the thing is, we found that when we speak on the blower, that it's just lovely to speak to each other. And there's always so much to talk about. And I think this is the first of a zillion conversations that we're going to have. And I'm so pleased um, because I didn't, I didn't know that we were going to be friends, but we are. Exactly. There you go. You see, it's not, that's right. Like, exactly. There's a very good point. Anybody listening to this, you never know where your next friend's going to come from, but you only make them by by making, by sort of practising. Even if it's just by saying hello to the person in the sweet shop every day, you know, you might bump into somebody else or whatever it is, yes. but there's always some, somebody else around the corner. That's right. So I'm very pleased we're, we're new friends now. Exactly. Great. Right.